George, if you ask most people what really exists, yeah. they would have physical things. If they happen to be believers, theists, they would also add spiritual things like God. Yeah. But philosophers, when they think about everything, the world's more complicated than that. When you think about what things really exist, yeah. what kinds of categories mm -hmm. do you imagine? I think for a scientist and for a hardcore scientist, there are actually four different kinds of existence they must acknowledge. Firstly, the world of particles and forces. And it's important there to recognize its hierarchical structure. We're made of atoms, molecules, and so on. And the fact that we're made of atoms does not mean we don't exist as people. A table is made of molecules, it exists as a table. So in other words, in that hierarchy, there's a reality at the level of protons, neutrons, there's a reality at the level of atoms, there's a reality at the level of the table. That's number one. I regard then my philosophy is something else must be said to exist if it can be shown to have a causal effect on that world of particles and forces. So then the second one, which Karl Popper and John Eccles wrote about and then Roger Penrose, is the world of human intentions and thoughts because those manifestly are able to influence what happens in, in, in the world. I, the pair of spectacles I have, the television set that people are looking at, these are all the result of human intention. So human intentionality does have physical effects and therefore it must be said to exist. So do emotions. Emotions are also causally effective and social constructions. A very interesting example there being money. A piece of paper, which is money, attains its causal efficacy because of the social context in which it exists. And it is very clearly causally effective. What is being causally effective is not the piece of paper, it's the social context. So this concept of causality yeah. is not just a relationship, no. but has real existence? Yes. And I like to think, for instance, of the existence of a jumbo jet. It exists because someone planned it. Now, that plan does not exist in any single person's mind. It starts off in a person's mind, but it then gets put down on paper. It gets into written down um, in, in specifications. It occurs in computer programs. You can talk about it. You can draw pictures about it. And the actual concept of the jumbo is an abstract concept, which is, in, in mathematical terms, an equivalence class for representations. <laughs> That equivalence class, that abstract thing, is causally effective because that's what leads, in a sense, to the existence of the physical object. Okay, let's go on to the third uh, class. The third one is a class of physical possibilities. Now, when we play football, for instance, you can't violate conservation of momentum. Animals exist within a possibility space which Darwinian evolution explores. That possibility space underlies what actually exists. And the things that exist are constrained by that possibility space. So in some sense, it's much more rigid. In a certain sense, it's more real than the contingent world of things, which are all kind of messy. And so in that world is the world, if you like, of physical laws. And in fact, physicists tend to think of physical laws in some sense as being eternal, unchanging. In fact, they have been commented many of the properties of God. <laughs> but the point is the laws themselves are not the same as the matter which obeys the laws. Those are quite distinct. The possibility space is explored by the matter and is therefore different from the matter which explores it. But what you're saying is the possibility space, in one sense, is more real yes. than the contingent things that actually Th that is, happen. That is correct. There, there, there are these millions of different kinds of animals which could exist and which evolutionary history didn't bring into existence, but they may exist on other planets somewhere else. But they're possible. Can we pick up there are millions? Pick up on that point again. There are millions of animals. Yeah. There are millions of possible animals which have never come into existence on Earth, but they may exist somewhere else. The possibility space for animals is the same here as it is on other planets. And that possibility space always exists and is an absolutely part of reality. That is correct. It, 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 it underlies the physical reality, but it's strictly constrains it. You cannot violate it. So therefore, it is very clearly causally effective. As an example, you cannot have a mouse that is six foot long because it won't survive because the scaling law, it'll fall flat on the floor because of the force of gravity. Well, I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> so now, no, category four. The fourth category is mathematics. And I believe, like most working mathematicians, that Mathematics lives in some abstract platonic space. Roger Penrose has written about this very nicely. Now, what's the evidence for that? It's something like the following. The square root of two is irrational. Now, mathematics did not want it to be irrational. They proved it was irrational against 
what they wanted. That is the characteristic of real existence. You find out, and it's not what you want it to be. Another very interesting example is the Mandelbrot set, those beautiful pictures of those recurring patterns. Now, in some sense, those were sitting waiting to be discovered for 14 billion years yeah, yeah. until we had the computers able to find them. Mathematics is causally effective in the following sense. That abstract thing, the Mandelbrot set, can be then seen on a screen or printed in a book. There, it is, it is made real in the ink patterns or the patterns of light on the screen. So it is causally effective in that sense. The number pi is another example. That underlies all engineering design and so on. And you might want it to be 22 over 7. <laughs> it is not. Mathematicians in Alpha Centauri or the Andromeda will agree with us on Earth its value is not 22 over 7. And so for that reason, I think like other working mathematicians, there is a platonic world of mathematical existence unaffected by human thought. We discover it. We don't invent it. Are there other things in that platonic space? Well, some physicists in effect think the laws of physics lie in there, some don't. We don't actually know the nature of the laws of physics at a fundamental ontological, that is, existential way. We don't know if the laws of physics describe what happens or prescribe what happens, and that's a very deep and unsolved argument about the nature of physical laws. Is there anything else in that platonic realm, like <laughs> relationships or um, logical possibilities? Oh, logic, very much so. Logic, again, we cannot violate logic. We discover the nature of logic rather than inventing it again. And so, yes, I would put logic there, too. So that world, your world four, yeah. your category four, is a very rich and diverse and, and almost infinite world. And it underlies physics, which is one of the puzzling things. One of the puzzles which physicists are aware of, why is it that the laws of physics are described in mathematical terms, this mm. relation mathematics to physics, is it by chance, in some sense, that the nature of matter is such that, that, that physics is described by matter? Or are, in some sense, the laws of physics written on some tablet in some platonic space and matter has to... We, 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 we don't understand that. So, but anyhow, my point is that I reckon a working physicist, when they really think about it, and allowing for biological reality actually has to allow all these four to exist. There's nothing about theology. That I think you have got a causally incomplete view of the world if you don't allow for the existence of these So four. your argument would be that those four worlds, four categories, are applicable to everyone, no matter what their philosophical that or is, theological disposition that may is be. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, where we get into the domain which is debatable, I, like my colleague Nancy Murphy, believe that there is, in some sense, also a abstract or platonic world of moral reality, that the, the moral reality is laid down in some sense. And this is because if you don't have such a thing, you are unable to characterize an act as genuinely evil or genuinely good. If you don't believe in a moral reality, you either have to follow, follow the moral relativists and say, well, Hitler behaved that way, it's, that was acceptable in his society, the, the genocide in Rwanda, that was acceptable in that society. You cannot say it is evil if you don't believe in a moral reality independent of time and culture and place. So this becomes your fifth world or fifth category. That becomes my fifth world, yes. Now, you also talk about a meta world. Okay. The question is, what is the foundation of all of these worlds? And the age-old theological position on this, which is that these, in turn, are based in the nature of God. They are in the mind of God, something like that. And I think some such unifying explanation is a satisfying explanation, which satisfies the Occam's razor view of life, a very simple foundational view which underlies the nature of these things. Now, that relies on all sorts of other kinds of argument. And the thing which is absolutely clear, this cannot be proved to be correct. Belief that this is true is a faith statement. And there's no way it will ever be proven by science, by philosophy. It will always be something which you adopt as a faith hypothesis. But also, the attempt to show it is incorrect also cannot be you cannot prove this does not exist, God does not exist. And when some scientists try to say science proves God does not exist, that is a intellectually incorrect statement. It's false philosophy. And that has been known since the time of Immanuel Kant. <laughs>